everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, before I get started, let's just get this thing done and over with. All right, let's get it out of the system. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, this, are, this is the outline of my talk today. So um, I want to talk about the current landscape of developing for Apple platform. And um, then we start the discussion of whether is this a good time of adopting Swift into our projects. Uh, but before I, provide or before I provide my suggestion or answer to that question, um, I wanted to show you how um, common Objective-C patterns are done in Swift. And also, after doing that, let's talk a little bit more about some of the nice stuff you get if you adopt Swift in your projects. So uh, Swift 1.0 came out uh, in 2014 during WWDC. And uh, every year, with every WWDC, we get a new version of Swift. right? And every version comes with uh, fantastic new features. And um, I've been following all the, the updates closely. But also, I've been going on an emotional roller coaster, right? <laughs> so first point all came out. You know, this is how I felt. You know, I was naive, and I got very excited. I started adopting Swift in my projects. And then 2.0 came out, right? And all that changes. All the, my code stopped compiling properly. All the errors happened, and I got scared, right? So I took a pause. I, um, I started going back into Objective-C again, because that's my, that's my comfort code, right? I, it always works, and you know, there's no problem with it. And um, with 3.0, again, they got this you know, grand Swift renaming happening. And um, it's, I think this is at this, it is this point now where we should you know, um, take a look at what has happened and whether this is a good moment for us to you know, start adopting Swift. Um, if, you, if you don't recognize him, he's crusty. He's from one of the WWDC presentation. He's a wise programmer. So it's good for us to you know, be like him and think about, is this a good time for us to use Swift? Not just because it's the coolest um, language out there. So uh, you know, uh, this is uh, the current landscape we have for developing for Apple platform. Objective-C is well and alive. Um, there's no sign of it going away just yet. You know, Apple's been, with, with all, every new release of Xcode, they've been adding new stuff into Objective-C as well. And of course, I'm sure a lot of you have existing projects and code in Objective-C. And um, as far as I know, there's no exclusive framework uh, for Swift. So you don't really get any, uh, any exclusive things for adopting Swift. And let's be honest. Uh, there is a significant investment of time and effort for every one of us to, to learn and keep ourselves up to date with all the new stuff that Swift has, right? And so moving on to the next section, um, I wanted to start the discussion about, you know, is this a good time for us to start adopting Swift into our projects? For me, one of the biggest challenges about using Swift is uh, because the language itself is, is pretty new, and it's, it's so novel. So the language itself is constantly changing, uh, which is a good thing, right? It's new. It's, it, it needs all that changes. A lot of proposals are being accepted by the community, and it's being implemented in every release. And because of that, stability suffers. So I've talked about source stability. So your code that compiles with the 1.0 uh, compiler stops working when the 2.0 compiler ships. And, uh, Beyond source stability, you've also got the problem of ABI stability. So ABI is application binary interface stability. So what this means is if you have a, a piece of software, so uh, say a framework or a library that was built with Swift 2.0 compiler, uh, that will stop working with Swift 3.0 code. And so that will, of course, introduce a lot of problems as well. Um, but hopefully and um, fortunately, things are settling down. And this is what they promise. So going from 3.0 to 4.0 will hopefully be a smaller change in terms of breaking, breaking things around. Um, so that's, that's where Swift is. So I wanted to show you um, what kind of changes, or this is just a small example of, of the kind of changes you'll experience if you've been following the bleeding edge with, with Swift. So 
this is a fairly common or a very si simple example. So we are iterating over a list. So I wanted to print out the item in the list, um, the index, and the element that's in the list. So I do a for loop. In Swift 1.0, so you, you can do this for loop, say for index element in, and then I call this function enumerate. I pass in my list as the parameter, and then I do my print for every single element. And then Swift, Swift 2.0 came out. They've changed it now so that you need to call enumerate on the list itself. They changed print, print ln into print because you know life's too short to have ln. And 3.0 again, they changed enumerate into enumerated. So this is just a one a very small example of the changes you have to deal with um, if you're following Swift. All right, so we are all you know, here because we like to build apps. And at the end of the day, the question that we, we want to know is, you know, we spend all these effort uh, into learning Swift. And can Swift actually help us to build better apps? Uh, before I give you my answer, um, let's, t let's take a look at you know, how things are currently done in Objective-C versus how things are done in Swift. All right, so I'm going to choose you know, five common code patterns that you, we often do in Objective-C and, and sort of contrast how things can be done in Swift. All right, so uh, first example is, is switching. So switch statement got a big upgrade in Swift. You, we can now do switching based on the value of a string. So my example here, I'm doing um, a switch statement. I wanted to get a number um, based on the name of the Pokemon. So um, you can do that now. You can just do case Bulbasaur and you return one, Ivysaur you return two, and Venusaur you return three, and so on. Right? So that uh, makes it uh, the switch statement much more easier to read as well because you get the actual, you can actually switch on the value itself. Beyond that, switch, uh, Swift also offer you to do switching based on a range of values. So uh, here we have you know, a value, a CP value. So if, if CP value is between zero and a, uh, is from zero to 1,000, then we say you need more training. Uh, if it's between 1,000 to 2,000, we'll say it's, it's better worthy. If it's between 2,000 and 3,000, it's gym leader quality. So uh, if you are handling, if, you're, if your switch statement needs to handle a wide range of values, this makes it a, a much more read readable code. Right? And beyond that, you can also do switching based on this new structure called um, a tuple. So a tuple is a little small uh, data structures that you can create uh, using two values. So for example, in here, I'm creating a new tuple um, based on uh, a Pokemon and its CP value. Right? So this tuple, uh, it's monster. So uh, in, in this switch statement, I could do something cool like this. So if I wanted to have the switch, uh, if I wanted to lo the logic to say, if that monster is a Pikachu, um, I don't really care what CP value. I will always say, I choose you, right? And um, so this is, this is how you can, you can express it. So Pikachu, and then you use underscore, just means you don't care what CP value it is. And then you will return the string. Uh, if it's a magic app, then things get complicated, right? Um, so you have to look at the CP. If it's between 140 to 200, then you know, maybe that's worth keeping. And um, you know, lastly, this is sort of like a, a catch-all situation where you just say, if it's, I don't really care what it is, I just say meh. Right? So um, this is, this is the, how you know, Swift has a much better way of handling a switch statement now. Uh, the next thing is a lazy variables. Uh, this, is, this is something that's also fairly common in Objective-C, uh, where you have a property in your class, you have an instance variable, but you don't really want to initialize it uh, when the instance is created. You only want it to be created when it was first used. This has benefits because if it was never used, then you save the memory of creating it, right? So usually what we do is, you know, we have the property um, declared, and then in the getter method for that, uh, for that variable, we do a check. If that variable is nil, then we initialize it with some content, and then we return it. 
Uh, this is a nice pattern to have, but it's also quite tricky for someone who, uh, who are not well versed in Objective C. So, firstly, you have to understand that uh, this would be this would match up to that variable name, and it is the getter method of it. And that's they are usually you know separated quite far from each other, so you might forget that you have to do this, and then you get nil for your for your uh, variable, and it's sad, right? So, in Swift. Uh, you can do that all together. So in Swift, functions become a, a first-class citizen. So you can actually use uh, a function to initialize your, uh, your lazy variables. And here you can, you can, um, you can use a function to, uh, to initialize Pokemon's array. And uh, Swift will guarantee that this, this bit of code here would only be run uh, the first time when um, Pokemon is accessed. So if you've never accessed Pokemon at all in your code, this wouldn't, well, this wouldn't get run at all. And because of this nice property, uh, you can also use this same behavior to create singleton in Swift in one line, right? So you can have a static, so that's a class variable here. So let's call that share instance. Oh, if you, uh, if you haven't used singleton before, so singleton is a pattern where you only want to have in the, your whole code to have one instance of a particular class, right? So for example, here, um, we're only ever going to get one Professor Oak. So um, I'm going to have a share instance for Professor Oak. And this is how you can define it. So static let share instance equals Professor Oak. And, um, and that's it. That's your, that's your singleton right here. So it's very simple to use that. Uh, so the next thing I want to look at is um, calling this or working with these C-ish looking libraries. Uh, so there are you know, two of them that I use very commonly. One of them is Core Graphics. The other one is Grand Central Dispatch. I'll use Core Graphics as my example here. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand the code. Just know that it's very ugly and it's, it's hard to use. This is the code you need to, to draw a 100 by 100 pixel white square right, using Core Graphics in Objective-C. And when Swift came out, you know, they didn't really do a lot to, for, for us to deal with uh, this C library. So it looks kind of the same. You know? um, this is actually really easy to port to, to Swift um, when, when you know, Swift 1 and 2 came out. Uh, but because of that, there's really not much you gain by adopting Swift if you're writing mostly core graphics code. But in 3.0, They've actually go in and um, do the whole renaming thing and makes things much simpler to use. So just pay attention to this bit in the middle. So now, if you have a CG context reference, you can actually call method on that, um, just like how you do, you know, uh, method call on objects. So that makes your code instantly more readable, and it saves you from from repeatedly using context as a parameter to your to your function call. All right, so that makes the whole code more modern, and it's, it's less error prone as well. OK, next, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, this topic, subclassing. So, uh, and I'm going to use these, these things. So these are items from a game called Pokemon Go, right? <laughs> and um, so in this game, we have a, a whole bunch of items that you, you get to carry in your bag. So you've got these Pokeballs where you can use to catch Pokemons. Uh, we've got potions that you can use to heal them. There's berries that help you to make them easier to be caught. And there's incubator, which helps you to hatch these eggs. Anyway, so we, when we're trying to um, model them into, in, our, in our program, uh, you know, quite straightforwardly, we can have an, an item as our superclass. And uh, we can have you know, four subclasses from, from item. We call them Pokeball, Potion, Incubator, and, and Raspberry. And within those, those classes, you can have subclasses as well. So maybe I'll have two subclasses for Pokeball um, to represent the normal one and the Ultra Ball, for example. Right? So that's all well and good. But then when you start to think about this further, uh, what happened uh, when you need to implement all these different behaviors for these items. So because they're, they have slightly different behaviors, so like some items can be throw at wild Pokemon. Some items are usable on, um, on, on a Pokemon. So for example, you can use potion on Pokemon to heal them. 
And some of them uh, disappears as soon as you use them, right? So the, the ball disappear, the potion disappear, the berry disappear, but not the incubator. In fact, one of the incubator never disappears, right? And um, some of them uh, works for a duration of time. Um, so in order for you to really model these behavior in your class, very, very quickly, uh, it will screw up your class hierarchy, and it will make your code quite hard to maintain as well. Right? And we, we become confused. So uh, how can Swift help with that? So Swift has this thing called protocol-based programming, which um, in Jake's presentation this morning, that was, um, it uses this to uh, such an extent. I highly recommend you to go view his video if you missed his talk. Um, he uses protocol-based programming to implement um, all those different um, fantastic behavior in IB animate, animatable as well. So protocol-based programming, um, to, to, those of, to those of you who've done Objective-C before, it's not completely new. You've already, start, you've already used this in, um, in your, uh, your Objective-C code. Uh, but what they've done is they've taken it and make it super uh, powerful to use, so extra power to it. So it makes it available to all these different types. So you can now, you can now um, use protocol in classes, structs, and enums. And you can also provide default implementation to all your, um, to all your adoptees. So if you have a default implementation for a protocol, all the classes that adopt that uh, protocol will get those for free. It's kind of like subclassing. But what makes it better than subclassing is type can now adopt multiple protocols, which is something you can't do with classes. Right? So <clears throat> how do we use that to help us with our problem here? Um, so I can have a protocol that's called Trollable. And in there, I can provide a, a default implementation here uh, called throw at wild Pokemon. And all I need to do is for every item class that, uh, that needs to be thrown at the Pokemon, I could just make it adopt throwable. And all of the classes will get that for free. And of course, if you want to do something custom with, that, um, with, the, with the behavior, you can always override it and implement it yourself. So um, let's illustrate how that can help to solve that problem. So it becomes kind of like a pick and choose problem. And um, so what you could do is, you know, you can, um, you can make Pokeball and Raspberry adopt throwable. Uh, you can make these three classes adopt perishable, uh, and it becomes very easy to organize and maintain your code. And, and lastly, uh, this, uh, this is a very common pattern we use in Objective-C um, for building string, string with format. I'm sure all of you have encountered string with format before. It is very widely used, um, but it, it is a quite a cumbersome method because you have to have this format string. And usually in the format string, you'll have all these weird symbols in there for the format identifier. So you, know, you have to remember percent %i is for integer, percent %f for float, uh, percent %a for string. And if you mistype anything, that will create problems with your, with your string as well. So in Swift, what they've done instead is they've got this new trick called string interpolation. So, um, so let's, uh, let's just say here I have four um, variables here. I've got a monster that is a string, skill name uh, uh, so is also a string. I've got two numbers here. Um, basically, what you need to do to build the string is you just need to put your variable inside this forward slash bracket. And Swift will handle um, you know, passing or understanding of the content of your variable and use that to build the string. So it's almost like you, you're writing a sentence now. So you say, monster, use the skill plus this message, it's super effective, right? And you can also do some um, computation within, within the brackets as well. So for example, here, enemy attack, um, that monster's HP is down to the health minus the attack times two, for example. So um, Swift will then do the calculation and then present the result and then build it into your string. So your format or your string now becomes much, much more readable than all these symbols in, um, in string with format. So I've taken a look at all the, you know, some of the common patterns and how they are better now in Swift. 
Um, so let's take a step further and look at some of the, the cool Swifty things you get once you uh, started using Swift as well. Um, so I'm, I've chosen three things that I want to talk about today. So firstly, there's static typing and type inference. Um, secondly is something that I touched on a little bit earlier, so functions as a first-class citizen. And then lastly, I want to talk about operator overloading and custom operator. Um, and which, uh, each of these features, I want to introduce um, one library, that third-party library that I found that have used these features um, very creatively to make writing Swift code um, very much more easier and much more readable as well. Will make the code much more readable. So, um, static typing and type inference. So, it's a fancy name, but it basically means that um, Swift will try to guess the right type that you that you mean with your variable, and it actually enforces that during compile time. And what that means is your method now can. Um, well, what that means is now your uh, your code will know which specific method to call based on the type of your variable or the type of your parameter that pass into the method. So one library that's, that has done this quite well is reusable. And uh, reusable. So uh, to illustrate how much that has helped, self row at index path. This is a classic for uh, table, table view code. So this is usually how you, you have to, uh, this is a method you have to implement in, a, in order to show cell on your table view. And this is, this is usually a very ugly bit of code in here. So you usually have to use a string um, as an identifier to tell table view which, exactly which cell you wanted to dequeue, right? And when it dequeued, you have to cast it into the right type so that you actually get all that instance um, variable of that type. And you know, if you make a mistake in, in your string, uh, Xcode is not going to tell you during compile time, and you will get a crash when your app runs. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is quite tricky. Um, and what they've done in reusable is you can now declare, let your cell be a particular type of cell. And because Xcode or because Swift enforces the type, it will then run the correct DQ reusable cell method that, that returns the cell of the right type to you. you. You notice here that I'm not using any string at all to declare the type of cell that I want, right? And the cell that it returns is actually already of the expected type. So you can straight away call all that you know, uh, class method for the cell, and it's definitely much, much less pr prone to typing errors, all right? Uh, secondly, okay, functions. Uh, because functions become a first-class citizen in Swift, it means that you can use functions everywhere. So I'll show you an example of using it to set your lazy variables. You can also pass functions as parameters to your functions. Uh, and what this guy at um, async has done is he's used that uh, in a very creative way to create this syntactic sugar for calling um, methods or for using Grand Central Dispatch, right? This is a very common pattern that we've used in Objective-C. So you have a long-running task. You do dispatch async. You send that task to your background queue. So this is run on the background queue. But usually when that task is completed, you want to update your UI. And the right way to update your UI is to make sure that happens on the, on the main thread. So usually what we do is we do a nested dispatch async in here and say, get the main queue, and this is where we do all the UI update. That's fine, but the code is sort of hard to read, and it's also cumbersome to write. So what they've done is they've got this new class called async, and you can basically call all these different methods, so background, main, user, user initiated. They all represent the right, um, the right queue for you, and it supports all the modern queues that iOS has. And basically, you just pass in a function um, that you want to run on that queue. And they've taken this a step further and, because that function itself returns another structure that takes in a function. So you can practically chain these calls to make one function runs after the other. And you can also pass in parameters like that to make sure you've inserted a little bit of delay between each block. 
So your GCD code now becomes much easier to read and write as well. <clears throat> And um, so they've also done, um, you can also group these tasks together into async group. So you can run them all together and you can wait on them um, until they're all done before continuing with your code. So it makes things a little bit uh, easier to manage as well. Okay, so lastly, operator overloading and custom operator. So this is a very powerful feature that Swift provides. It basically means that you can extend the language with new, new operators. So um, to give you a simple example is, you know, we can have a plus operator, and you can put it between two strings. And uh, the default implementation basically means the two strings are, are concatenated together, so they become one string. But what about if I need a plus symbol to, uh, if I want a plus symbol to work between a potion item and a Pokemon object? So if I wanted that to, to basically means I can then use the potion on the Pokemon to heal it, right? And you can do that with Swift by um, implementing or overloading the plus operator. So you can, you can make it do um, new things or make it have new behavior by overriding it, overloading it. But use that, use that with care because it is a double-edged sword. If you started implementing uh, this obscure behavior to your operator, or if you start implementing custom operator with obscure meaning, um, the people that you know, sort of have to maintain your code may not understand why you do it, and it makes your code quite hard to understand as well, because it makes the code more concise. All right, so um, the library that I want to talk about is called Swift Auto Layout and Swift Visual Format. So they've, what they've done is they've taken this approach to make auto layout, code, auto layout code much, much simpler to write. So this first line is how you define a constraint using Swift auto layout. And that's equivalent to writing this whole chunk of code here, which is using Apple's API, NS layout constraint, blah, 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 blah. So it also, it also makes your, your constraint much easier to understand, right? It's much easier to scan and understand what it is because you, you get rid of all this noise. Um, and lastly, you know, I can't, I can't not talk about this great feature in Swift. You can write code like that if you so want to, right? So this is, this is, you know, we are programmer. Code is how we express ourselves. If you like emoji, yeah, why not, right? So I've talked about all these, all these features, and I think, I think at this point, um, because of the changes moving forward, will be quite minimal. I, I personally think this is a good time for you if you haven't tried Swift to give it a try. Um, all that features that I talk about, it actually help you to write your code in better and, and safer way. So you might end up saving some time, which you can then spend on polishing your app. So I think overall, you know, Swift is helpful, and you can always start by implementing a little part of your, your project in Swift and then make it work with your Objective-C code. All right. Thank you. <laughs>